Well, hello, Saddleback, and happy summer. It's good to see you. Uh, I want to say hi to everybody who's watching online. You know, we now have Saddleback small groups that meet all across the country, all across the United States, and then tune in together as groups, and every week, 11,500 people watch through their groups who don't live here in the area. In fact, since January, over 900 people have come to Christ online through the service. Isn't that neat? Now, if you'll take out your message notes, we're gonna continue in our series on the Beatitudes, the keys to a blessed life. And Jesus says there are eight things that bring God's blessing in your life. I want your life to be blessed. I want my life to be blessed. And Jesus says these are the keys to being blessed by God. Now you know, our culture is absolutely obsessed with appearance, how you look. We're all about image. And uh, if you're beautiful, then you're considered bright and you're considered the best, which leaves most of us not in the brightest and best. Uh, now, you could be sexy like me, But the Bible says God couldn't care less how you look. God is not into appearance. God couldn't care less about your achievements, your accomplishments, or your acquisitions. God isn't interested in how educated you are or how wealthy you are. God doesn't care about how popular or how famous you are. What God cares about is not your image, but he cares about your health and your heart and what's inside you, the real you. The Bible says in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 16, it says this in verse seven. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so today we come to the sixth of Jesus' eight beatitudes of ways to be blessed. And in Matthew chapter five, verse eight, talking about heart, it says this. God blesses those whose hearts are pure for they will see God. Now, what in the world does that mean? God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. First, what does it mean they will see God? This verse says, the people whose hearts are pure, they're the ones who get up close to God. They get to experience the presence of God. They get to feel the power of God. They get to know the purpose of God for their life. They get to live in the peace of God. They experience the pardon of God. These are the people who really have it. He says, God blesses those who are pure in heart. They're the ones that God says, this guy, he's my friend. This woman, she's my friend. So what does it mean to be pure in heart? That's not a term we use in today's language. We don't talk about say, oh, she's got a pure heart. The word for pure in heart today is the word integrity, integrity. Now the Bible uses the word integrity a lot, but it actually even uses the word blameless more. Now what does it mean to have integrity? Because if God says, I, I bless those who have integrity, what does it mean to have integrity? Well it doesn't mean sinless, and it doesn't mean perfect, and it doesn't mean you don't make any mistakes. If you have to be sinless to have integrity, nobody's got integrity, because we all blow it. Uh, it doesn't mean perfect, because if you have to be perfect and never do anything wrong to have integrity, then none of us will ever have integrity. It doesn't mean uh, you never make any mistakes. If that were true, none of us would ever have integrity. So it's not talking about being perfect, being sinless. What does it mean to be pure in heart? Let me explain something to you. God is more interested in the direction in, of your heart than he is in the sins you commit. He's more interested in your attitude even than your actions. He's more interested in why you do what you do than what you do. In the Bible, there are many examples of, uh, of people who did the right thing for the wrong motivation and God says, doesn't count. It doesn't count at all. On the other hand, the Bible tells us about a number of leaders, different kings of Israel, who actually didn't always do the right thing and actually did some sin, and yet God said, they're okay. They're okay. 
They didn't remove all of the idols that were in the thing, but they were a good king. And so God is actually more interested in your heart, the direction of your heart, than he is in your actual sins and what you do and don't. So what is integrity? The Bible says that Noah had integrity. The Bible says that uh, Abraham had integrity, that David had integrity, that uh, Moses had integrity, that, that uh, Paul had integrity. Yet none of these guys were perfect. I mean, let's just take David an example. God says about King David, there is a man who has a heart like mine. He's a man after my own heart. And you read that and you go, what? This is a guy who committed adultery and murdered the, the girl's husband. One time he pretended he was mentally insane to get out of a thing. He did all kinds of weird things. He was not perfect in any sense. And yet God says, that guy over there, yeah, he's, he's really messed up, but he's got a heart like mine. I want you to have a heart like God's. I want to have a heart like God. I want us to be people of integrity. So, <coughs> excuse me. Wow, that felt good. And you didn't even have to say, God bless you. Oh, you did? Thank you. God bless you too. You have integrity. Thank you. <laughs> All right, write down three words. Three words that define what it means to be a man of integrity, what it means to be a woman of integrity. The first meaning of integrity is wholeness. Wholeness. It means your life isn't divided up into compartments. It's not divided into segments. You don't have your life all divided up in little, little categories. Your life is one large whole. We get the word integrity from the word integer or integer. You remember in math, an integer is a whole number. It's not a fraction. It's not a part of a number. It's not a decimal. It's a whole number. And integer means whole, and integrity means your life is a whole. We get the word uh, integration from the word integer or integrity. Integration is the opposite of segregation. Segregation means you, you divide things up or divide people up or whatever into different categories. Integration means, no, no, we're all part of the same family. We don't think the same, look the same, smell the same, act the same, don't have the same background, don't have the same skin color, don't have, but we are all in the same family. We are integrated. That's part of integrity. When you segregate your life, you don't have integrity. You see, it's like this. A lot of people, they think of their life as like a pie. And the different things in their life are the different parts of the pie. And I see, this slice of the pie is my career. That's my work life. And then this slice of the pie, this is church. This is my spiritual life. And then this is my family life. That's the slice. And then over here, this is my social life, my sports life. And then here is my sex life. That's a part of my, my uh, you know, pie. And then over here is my secret life, my compulsions, my addictions, the things that nobody else knows about, my secret life. And then over here, this is my, like my, uh, my uh, friendship life. If you segment your life like that, you lack integrity. Because it's the exact opposite of your life being a whole. Integrity is not the parts of the pie, it's the filling in the whole pie. And it means you're exactly the same with everybody you talk to, no matter which part of your life you're dealing with. You don't change, you don't wear a mask, you don't pretend. And that's the second word I want you to write down. Integrity means authenticity, authenticity. It means you keep it real. It means you're the real deal. You're not a fake, you're not a phony, you're not blowing people off with some scam, you're not faking it till you make it, you're not pretending, you're not copying anybody else, you're not trying to be somebody you're not. You are exactly who you appear to be. And if you have integrity, you act the same no matter where you are. That is, I act the same way with my grandkids as I do with you, as I would with the Prime Minister of England. It's what you see is what you get, it's warts and all. It's not like I'm trying to be one way here and one way there and one way here. No, you're just who you are for good or for bad. 
Thousands of years ago, during the great Greek culture, when Plato and Socrates and Aristotle and Euripides and Aristophanes and uh, all these guys were writing these plays, these classic plays, Homer uh, and the Iliad and the Odyssey, all of these things, well, uh, they used to have in Greek plays mul multiple roles by one actor. And what is, a, a guy would come from backstage out into the forum to play a part, and he would hold up a mask, and he'd wear a mask, and he would say certain things and play that role. Then he'd walk backstage, get another mask, come back out, and he'd play another role wearing another mask. Then he'd walk backstage, change it, get another mask, and come back out, and in Greek plays, one guy could have multiple roles and many masks. And he was called, in Greek, the hypocritos. The hip, we get the word hypocrite from it. What does it mean to be a hypocrite? It means you're not the same with everybody. It means you, you talk one way with this group and you talk another way with this group and you use this kind of language over there, that kind of language over there, and you actually are wearing masks. That is the exact opposite of integrity. You lack authenticity. You're not the same with everybody. Integrity means you don't pretend to be something you're not. So it's wholeness, it's authenticity. The third thing that integrity is, write this down, is it means unmixed motivation. It means you do the right thing, but you do it for the right reason. Unmixed motivation. It means you're sincere. It means you're straightforward. It means you are pure in heart. Pure in heart means you don't have a mixed motive. In other words, you're doing it for the right reason. You can pray to talk to God, or you can pray to impress other people. One has integrity, and one doesn't. Integrity is what you are when nobody else is looking. Integrity is what you are in the dark. Integrity is what you really think, act, and do when nobody else will ever find out. That's the real you. Integrity, you see, we're more interested in image but God's interested in integrity. We're interested in reputation. God is interested in character. Reputation is what everybody thinks you are. Image, I mean, integrity is what you really are. Reputation is what you are in public. Integrity is what you are when you're all alone with God and it's just you and God. And God says, God blesses those who have integrity. They get to be the friends of God. Now, what does God say about this? Look at this verse up here on the screen, Proverbs chapter three. The Lord hates people with twisted hearts. What's a twisted heart? A perverse heart, a perverted heart, a deceitful heart, a demeaning heart, a, uh, a fake, a phony heart. It's not, you know, you don't really, you're not the real you. The Lord hates people with twisted hearts, but he delights, he delights in those who have integrity. I want God to delight in you. So what we're gonna do uh, this weekend is two things. First, I want us to look at some of the benefits of being a man of integrity or a woman of integrity. Uh, and Tom is gonna come and share in just a minute uh, two or three benefits. There are many, many benefits in scripture. We just don't have time to cover them all, so we'll only look at three of the promises that God says, if you live with integrity, then this is what's gonna happen in your life. And then I'm gonna come back and we're gonna look at a little checklist on how to get started and how even this week you could start working on becoming a woman of integrity or a man of integrity. So let's have Tom come and talk about some of the blessings that happen when I get this quality in my life. One of the great blessings, <laughs> one of the great blessings that comes when we have integrity is the blessing of personal confidence. You just live with a different kind of confidence because you're not trying to be a phony all the time. You're not trying to make sure that you're putting the right front with the right person all the time. So you're able to have a different kind of confidence. When you have integrity, you become the kind of person that other people like to be around because you know who you are. You know where you're going. You're even able to be upfront about your faults. You don't have to be a phony. And there's just something about that kind of confidence that not only is it attractive in others, it's, it's relaxing, it's strengthening in our own lives. I've always loved this picture, Proverbs 10, 9, of the kind of confidence that integrity brings. It says here, people with integrity have a firm footing, 
but those who follow crooked paths will slip and fall. So when I have integrity, I'm standing on solid ground. But when I don't have integrity, it's like back east in a, in a snowstorm, the path is all icy, and you're trying with all your might not to fall. And every bit of energy is making sure you don't slip and fall. That's what it feels like not to have integrity. You're, you're putting too much energy into making sure that you put the right false front. When you could just be honest, just be yourself. I, uh, I'll never forget talking to a business guy years ago, and I asked him, what's the number one thing that changed in your life now that you've become a follower of Jesus? He just started following Jesus a few months before. And he said, the number one thing that's changed, he said it right away, is the way I answer the phone. He said, I used to answer the phone and I would tell a different lie to everybody in my business and I'd have to look at their name and realize, what lie did I tell this guy? And before I answered the phone, know what lie in my mind. But now I can just answer, because I tell them the truth, I can just answer and they not even have to look at the name. That's what integrity does for you. It gives you this different kind of confidence. The Bible says in Proverbs 11:3, let's read this one together. The integrity of the honest keeps them on track. So integrity shows you the right way to go. It also shows you what to do next. Sometimes you start to wander through life. You're not sure what to do next. Maybe in a transition. Maybe one of your kids is going off to college. Maybe you just changed jobs. What do you do next? Well, the, the Bible says that when you have purity of heart, when you have integrity, you see God better. When you see God, you know what to do next because God has a purpose. God has a plan for your life. Integrity helps you to see God's plan and purpose for your life better. That's one of the things that gives you a greater confidence to live with. One of the great blessings of integrity. A second blessing of integrity is a lasting legacy. You get this lasting legacy. In fact, if you think about your life, your greatest legacy is in your integrity. Because it's a leg legacy that will last from generation to generation to generation. Everything else that we do, it gets lost. The money that you earn in the end, it's going to get divided amongst your kids if you have any money left, and it's going to get spent. The work that you do, it's going to be given to somebody else, and then you're going to be forgotten. All the trophies that you've earned, it's going to be thrown in the trash someday and taken to the dump. Isn't this encouraging about our lives? <laughs> but the integrity that you have, the character that you have, it's going to be translated into the lives of the people that are around you and then into the lives of the next generation and the next generation. It is a lasting legacy. Next verse in your outline, Proverbs 27, is especially encouraging for parents. It says, a righteous person lives on the basis of his integrity. Blessed are his children after he is gone. It's the blessing, moms and dads, of the character that you've given. I know there's no such thing as a perfect parent here, but you've made some good choices, and in those good choices, you're passing them on. And you might think, not me. I haven't made any good choices. I mean, I, I, I messed up on this one. I did not show integrity in my relationships, and because of that, I, I guess I don't get this blessing. Well, I just want to say to you, the story's not over. You can still have integrity in your life. And sometimes the greatest integrity you show is in a time when it seems like there's no blessings. A lot of us know the story of Job. If you're brand new in church, you might even know that story. The guy who lost it all. And he decided to have integrity even though he lost it all. He didn't know why he lost it, but he decided, I'm going to have integrity through this. In the next verse in your outline, Job 8, 5 to 7, one of his friends gives him this advice. If you pray to God and seek the favor of the Almighty, if you're pure and you live with complete integrity... God will rise up and restore your happy home. And though you started with little, you will end with much. And that is exactly what happened. Job decided to have integrity even through a difficult time. And because of that, in the end, he was doubly blessed. He was blessed even more in the end. Some of you, you you've gone through a tough time. There may be even a loss of integrity. And because of a loss, you start to think, what does it matter? I already messed up. So I may as well just keep messing up because what does it matter now? But I just want to say to you, the story is not over. And the truth of the matter is, your greatest integrity might be what you do after a loss of integrity. You can still respond with integrity then. And somebody's watching. And you know what? They're going to have a loss of integrity someday in their life. And you can show them even now what to do. You can still leave a lasting legacy. It's never too late. The story's not over. It's one of the blessings of integrity. A lasting legacy legacy, a personal confidence. And then there's this third blessing amidst all the others that we're looking at today, and that is the blessing of rewards in eternity. 
Now this, in one sense, is the greatest blessing because it's the one that lasts forever, the rewards that we get in eternity. Look what the Bible says about this in Matthew 25, 21. God will say one day, well done. You are a good and trusted servant. Because you were faithful with small things, I will now put you in charge of much greater things. So come and share your master's happiness. Now, would you circle for me two words in that verse? Would you circle the words small things? That's where the rewards are. We think that the rewards, the real integrity is in the big moments of life. It's easy to have integrity easier because you know everybody's watching. You, You can build yourself up for it. But it's in the small moments that you show real integrity. As Rick said earlier, integrity is who you are when no one's watching, no one's noticing. So what kind of integrity do I have in the, in the small things of life? Now, when it comes to integrity in the small things, when no one else is watching, we can all list the areas we've failed there. Uh, no, no one would want all of the small choices we made in our lives this last week even put up on the screen because there'd be some things we did not want people to see. It's easy to make a list of your sins and failures in the small things. But let's put those, let's take those and put them on the forgiven in Christ side of the ledger because he forgives those things. But I want to remind you, and this verse reminds us, there is another side of the ledger. And that is when you choose to have faith, when you choose to have integrity in the small things, that is on the rewarded side of the ledger. Every small thing you do, every small word of encouragement you give this next week, it is rewarded eternally. Every small Kindness, act of kindness that you give towards someone else, rewarded in eternity. Every time you reject a temptation, rewarded in eternity. Every time you pray a small prayer of faith, just a quick prayer of faith in a moment, that is rewarded in eternity. That's the power of integrity. That's the difference that integrity makes, not just here, but forever. That's the blessing of integrity. Now, it's, it's tough in the small things, because in the small things, it's just easy to get our perspective off, to get our perspective on the wrong thing. I told some of you this story a while back, but it's worth saying again because it it just fits so well here. A while back I was at uh, Home Depot getting some sod for my backyard. I had a dead area and I counted it out and I thought I needed about 22 pieces of sod. So I went down and I bought it and I said, where do I get it? And they said, oh, it's out in front, you just load it yourself. So I backed my car up and I start loading this sod in, counting one, two, three, four, five. About halfway through, I think, do I, maybe I might need 24 pieces. I don't know if I'm getting enough. But I didn't want to go back in and, and, get, and pay them again and have to come back out. So I start looking around thinking, who's going to notice if I take two extra pieces <laughs> while I'm doing this? I mean, no one's going to notice. And then I looked down and thought, there's just going to be a few pieces left. They're going to die out here in the sun anyway. I mean, it's not going to hurt anybody if I take a couple of extra pieces, counting them in. And then all of a sudden, the perspective hit me. And I, just, I, I started laughing out loud in the parking lot. I thought, the integrity issue I'm facing here is God or sod? Which one, which one of those is I'm, am I going to choose in this moment? <laughs> am I going to give up my integrity for a square of dirt? Is that what I'm going to do? And really in one way, it's all dirt. It's all dirt in this world compared to the integrity of the choice that you make for eternity. And when you make these small choices, when you make these small choices for eternity, it changes not only your life now, but also your life forever. Now, if you're talking about what Tom just talked about, I don't know about you, but I'm interested in these benefits. I'm interested in personal stability I'm interested in leaving a legacy, and I'm interested in rewards for eternity, and God says all three of these are wrapped up in having integrity. So how do you get it? How do you get integrity? What what does it even look like? Well, in Psalm chapter 15, the 15th Psalm, David gives us eight characteristics of what it means to walk or live with integrity. Let me read it to you. Psalm 15, one to five. Lord, who may stand in your sanctuary and who may live on your holy mountain? And what's he talking about here? This is a metaphor. He's saying, God, who gets to be close to you? That's what he's saying. Who gets to be your friend? All that thing, stuff I just was talking about earlier. The, uh, who gets to live in your presence? Who gets to experience your power? Who gets to understand your peace? Who gets to live your purpose? God, who gets to be your friend? That's what he's saying. Who may stay in your sanctuary and live on your holy mountain? Here's the answer. The one who walks with 
integrity. Circle that, walks with integrity. And then he gives us eight characteristics of a man who has integrity or a woman who has integrity. And here's what they are. Number one, he speaks the truth from his heart. You don't lie when you have integrity. He refuses to slander others with his tongue. Whoa. Anytime you put down anybody else, you've just lost integrity. Anytime you slander anybody else for their politics or their religion or their lifestyle or any other difference, cultural difference, whatever, he says, you've just lost your integrity. He refuses to slander others with his tongue. He won't listen to gossip. Oh, now we're, now we're meddling. He says, if you listen, not, not share it, but even if you just listen to it, you've lost your integrity. He will not cast a slur on his fellow man. Instead, he honors those who fear the Lord. And he keeps his promises even when it hurts. He lends his money freely without charging interest. In other words, he's very, very generous. That's a mark of integrity. And he cannot be bribed by money. Whoever does these things, these things will never be shaken. You wanna have security in your life? You wanna get rid of all the insecurity in your life? Get integrity in your life. You wanna have stability in your life? Get integrity in your life. You wanna have the confidence Tom was talking about? Then you gotta get integrity in your life. When you lack integrity, you go through life insecure. The Bible says the man of integrity walks securely. And the whole reason you don't have security, the whole reason you feel insecure so much of the time is because you lack integrity. Wholeness, authenticity, and a unmixed motivation. What I want to do now is give you a little checklist. It's a pretty quick checklist. It's not going to take a lot of time for me to explain it. In fact, I don't have to illustrate it because once I say these things, you'll understand it. Integrity demands that every area of your life is treated with the same intensity. That you say, I'm going to have the same commitment to excellence in my marriage as I have in my career. I'm going to have the same commitment to excellence in my ministry and in my parenting as I do in making money. I'm gonna have as much commitment to the right motivation as I do and to doing the right thing. So let me just give you six of the common ways. You can work on these this week from the Bible. Number one, you become a person of integrity by keeping your promises. By keeping your promises. People of integrity keep their word. If they say they'll do it, they'll do it. If they say they'll be there, they'll be there. They say you can count on it, you can count on it. People of integrity keep their promises. This is verbal integrity. And the Bible says in Proverbs 25 verse 14, people who promise things that they never give, he says they're like clouds and wind that bring no rain. He says they're worthless. There's been a hot, bunch of hot air. It's just vapor, there's, there's nothing to them. They don't bring wind, they don't bring uh, rain, they don't bring any benefit, they're just all smoke and mirrors. So my question to you is this, what promises have you made that you have not kept and you need to keep them before integrity say, have you made some promises to your kids? Broken promises are the number one cause of bitterness in children. The number one cause of bitterness, broken promises that parents said, I said, oh, mom you said, dad you said, they break the promise. Have you made a promise to your spouse about something you're gonna change and you haven't done it? It's a broken promise. Have you made a promise to God, a spiritual promise, a vow, and you haven't kept it? That is a lack of integrity. Now I know that what happens is we say, well, the circumstances have changed. Doesn't matter. If you made a promise, you gotta keep your word, even if it is not beneficial to you. Do you remember that Psalm 15 we just read? Let me look at it again here on the screen. Psalm 15 verse four. God blesses the one who walks with integrity, who keeps his promises even when it hurts. Even when it costs you more than you thought it was gonna cost you, you keep your promise. I said I'd sell it to you for that, I'm gonna sell it to you for that, even though it's worth a whole lot more, or whatever. You keep your promises even when it hurts. 
I remember when Matthew, my youngest son, was young, and he, he really struggled with panic attacks as part of his mental illness. Pan panic attacks are not mental illness, but he had that in addition too. And he struggled with a lot of fears in his life. And uh, I, I really wanted him to go to camp, but he was afraid to go to church camp. And so I made a promise to, to my young son. I said, Matthew, is sixth grade. I said, Matthew, uh, if you'll go to camp, I promise to go with you, and then you can handle it. You won't be afraid. I'll, I'll be there with you. I'll be your camp counselor. I'll go with you. And uh, he decided he didn't want to go. So I went ahead and I, I took some other commitments that week. Then he decided he wanted to go. <laughs> and I had made a commitment to speak to 100,000 men in a stadium of promise keepers in Atlanta. So I broke a promise to speak to the promise keepers to keep a promise to my son. <laughs> and I have never, never regretted that. Now, I would have had a whole lot more fun speaking to 100,000 men than being a camp counselor in sixth grade camp. Because <laughs> sixth grade camp is, all it is is candy and farts. That's it. <laughs> okay, that, that's, boys at least, I don't know about girls. Do girls fart? <laughs> Kay's not in this service, obviously. That'll get edited from the message, I'm sure. <laughs> you become a person of integrity by keeping your promises. Number two, you become a person of integrity by paying your bills. Now, you may not think this is a big deal, but it's a big deal to God. This is financial integrity. And the Bible says over and over and over and over again that the way you use your money is a test of your integrity. Do you spend more money than you make? That is a lack of integrity. Do you get yourself in debt to things that you can't pay off? That is a lack of integrity. The Bible says people of integrity pay their bills. It's like keeping your promises financially. Now, I'm not gonna go into all the different ways, but let me just give you a couple. Here's a couple verses. First, you don't default on loans, and you pay off your credit card. Psalm 37, 21 says, the wicked man borrows and never pays back. And not only that, this one's really meddling. Some of these are gonna get a little personal here. You don't defraud the government of taxes. The Bible says in Romans 13, verse six and seven, the authorities working are working for God. Pay what you owe them. Pay your personal and property taxes. You say, but Rick, they're, they're, the government is wasting my money. Of course I know that. <laughs> okay? And they're, they don't, uh, the government lacks integrity because they're spending far more than they take in. Okay? And they're doing deficit spending. But you don't get to do that if you have integrity. What they do with my taxes, they're gonna be accountable to God for, but I am accountable to God to pay my taxes to not cheat on them. Because if I do, I lack integrity. The Bible says to do that. Okay, number three. You become a person of integrity by keeping your promises, paying your bills, and number three, this one's really meddling, by refusing to gossip. And that's what the Bible says. This is relational integrity. And that is, you don't talk one way with one group of people and then go talk about them behind their back. If you flatter somebody and you butter them up and you act like they're best friends and then behind them you cut them off at the knees and you say one thing here and one thing there and you gossip, the Bible says you lack integrity. You don't have it. And you're not gonna have God's blessing on your life if you keep on gossiping like that. And the Bible says if you listen to it. Did you know that Accepting stolen goods gets the same criminal indictment as stealing it. And so accepting gossip is the same thing as offering it up. It's a wrong thing. Every time you gossip, you lose integrity. Do you talk about other people behind their back? Can you keep a secret? The Bible says this in Proverbs 11, verse 13. A gossip can't be trusted with a secret but someone of integrity won't violate a confidence. Do you know what we need today? We need men and women of integrity who know how to keep a secret. 
and not put it on Facebook or blab it on Twitter or pass it around on social media. You know, one of the rules of our small groups is what's said in the group stays in the group. Why? Because everybody needs a safe place of a few friends where you can be real and be yourself and have not other, everybody go publish it about you. Real friends walk into your life when everybody else walks out. And when you mess up and you really blow it, you need a few friends in your life who don't rub it in, they rub it out. And that's the purpose of a small group, one of the purposes. And so what's said in the group stays in the group. Can you keep a confidence? Or as soon as somebody says, no, I've never told this to anybody, you immediately go tell it to somebody else. If you do, you lack integrity. The Bible says this here on the screen, Proverbs 10, 18. Anyone who spreads gossip, God says, you're a fool. Anyone who spreads gossip is a fool. It's a foolish, destructive thing to do. All right, number four. I'm just going through these pretty quickly. Integrity is developed by keeping your promises, paying your bills, refusing to gossip. Number four, by faithfully tithing. Did you know that the Bible says that tithing is a test of integrity? One of the ways God tests my integrity is through tithing. Do I trust him with my finances? Do I put him first? Whatever, wherever you put your money first is what's most important to you. Let me say it again. Wherever you put your money first is what's most important to you. And the Bible says that tithing is a test of integrity because Jesus said wherever your heart is, Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart's gonna be. So you can always know what's important to people by looking at where they spend their money. Now here's what God says about this, Malachi chapter three. Is it right for a person to cheat God? Of course not. Yet you are robbing me, says the Lord. How, he asked. He says, you're, you're spending my money by withholding your full tithe and offerings. Bring to me the full amount of your tithe to my house. Put me to the test, and you'll see that I will open the windows of heaven and pour out so much blessing on you that you won't even have enough room to receive it all. This is a test, and this is a promise. It's the Pepsi Challenge for Jesus. God says, I dare you to trust me on this. I dare you to trust me. Do you have the integrity to put me first in your finances? Number five, you become a person of integrity. Keeping your promises, paying your bills, refusing to gossip, faithfully tithing, by doing your best at work. By doing your best at work. This is business integrity or vocational. We, spiritual integrity, tithing, and Relational integrity, not gossiping, and financial integrity, paying your bills. This is vocational integrity of having integrity where you work. Do you do your best at work, or do you just slough off when the, when the boss isn't watching? See, some people only work hard when the boss is around, when the supervisor's around. And the rest of the time, they're goofing off, they're playing around, they're standing in a water cooler, gossiping, they're playing solitaire on the computer or reading some online magazine, uh, they're, they're taking supplies home to their house, ripping off the office, they're you know, taking breaks, coming in late, as long as they're not being noticed. You may have never realized what a serious sin God considers it for you to give a full day's work when you're paid a full day's wage. You don't have the right to goof off. You say, well, everybody else is slacking off. Nobody else works hard in my office. Well, so what? They're not a follower of Christ. And maybe they don't care about integrity, and maybe they don't care about leaving a legacy, rewards for eternity, and personal you know, uh, stability, but you do. And so whether they work hard and well or not is irrelevant. Let me show you some, just a few verses about this here on the screen. Proverbs 18 verse nine says this, slack habits and sloppy work are as bad as vandalism. That's what God says about it. He says, you know, if you're just goofing off 
and you do poor work and you don't really, oh, that's good enough for this, you know, nobody's gonna even notice. He said, that's like vandalism. Let me show you in the, in the Living Bible. The Bible says this, a lazy employee is as destructive as a saboteur. Whoa, now we're really getting deep here. He's saying that if I am not given a full day's work for a full day's wage, I may hate my job, it doesn't matter if I hate it or not. I am actually vandalizing and I'm sabotaging somebody else's business if I'm not giving it my best. If I don't give it my best, then I lack integrity. Let me show you a couple other verses. Ephesians 6, 6 says this. Don't work hard only when your master, that's your supervisor, is watching and then shirk when he isn't looking. Work hard and work with gladness, and that's enthusiasm, all the time, even if you hate your job, as though working for Christ, doing the will of God with all your heart. It is God's will that you work hard and with gladness all the time as if you are working for Christ. You see, if you're a believer, your boss isn't your boss. Your real boss is God. And whether anybody else sees it or not, you say, nobody's gonna see whether I worked or not. God does, and he's your boss. Your boss isn't watching you all the time, but God is watching you all the time, and this is a test. It's a test of in integrity. And it's God's will that I not waste the time and the money and the resources of the owner of the business or my employer. Let me show you another one. Colossians 3.22 says this. And don't just do the minimum that will get you by. Do your best. That's integrity. Are you doing your best at work? If not, you need to change. You need to, what's called, repent. I need to not just do the minimum, I need to give it my best shot. Do your best. In fact, the next verse, Colossians 3.23, it's on your outline, says this. Work hard and cheerfully at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord. There, said it twice. Anytime the Bible says something twice, you better pay attention, okay? Work hard and cheerfully as whatever you do, as though you're working for the Lord rather than people. That is a mark of integrity. That I, that's my attitude. Imagine how the world would be changed if every Christian, there are two billion of us in the world, 2.3 billion. What if every Christian went to work on Monday morning with integrity and said, you know what, I don't care if everybody goofs off, I don't care if everybody slacks off, I don't care if everybody's just saying that's good enough for government work, I don't care what everybody else thinks, I'm gonna work hard, work cheerfully, and do, give it my best shot. What if Christians gained the reputation that people said, we only hire Christians, why? Because they're the best workers. They work with integrity. They put in the extra effort. They, do the, they, they go the second mile. They're, they're honest, they don't cheat, they're not lazy, they work hard. What kind of witness would we have in the world if we were all like that? Let me give you one more, give me one more. We become, you become a person of integrity by being real with others. You become a person of integrity by being real with others. You don't fake it, you are yourself, you don't pretend. It's what we were talking about earlier. You're authentic, you're genuine, you're not a hypocritos. You don't wear a mask and talk a certain way with this group and then go over here and wear another mask and act a certain way with this group. And you don't act one way in church and one way at work and then another way in the golf course or when you're playing, shooting some hoops or whatever. No, you're always the same. You're not perfect, you're not sinless. It's not that you don't make mistakes, you do make mistakes, but your heart's in the right direction. And you are real with other people. You're not a phony, you're not a fake. You're not trying to be something that you're not really. Second Corinthians 4, 2 says this. We refuse to wear masks. We refuse to play games. We don't maneuver and manipulate behind the scenes. And we don't twist God's word to suit ourselves. In other words, we say, well, I think this means this when we just don't like what it says. Rather, we keep everything we do and say out in the open. Your life is an open book, you're authentic. What you see is what you get. You are not 
a phony, you're not a fake, you're into integrity, not into image. Now, in a world that is absolutely obsessed with appearance and with image, how in the world do you keep it real when everybody else is faking it and everybody else is trying to live a, an image, be an image and act like they know this and do that and they don't have integrity and they're, they're scooting by and they're skimming and they're cheating and they're doing all, and they're not keeping their promises and all those things. How in the world do you keep it real? There's only one way. There's only one way. You gotta care more about God's approval than the approval of other people. That's the only way you'll ever become a man of integrity. That's the only way you'll ever come, become a woman of integrity because if you care about what God thinks, then you're gonna do the right thing. If you care about what other people think, you're gonna typically often do the wrong thing. Because what God thinks is sometimes unpopular, sometimes it's difficult. The only way you can maintain integrity is to care more about God's approval, well done, good and faithful servant, than to care about the approval of other people. Psalm 119.9 says this, how can I keep my way pure? Blessed are the pure in heart, they get to see God. How can I keep my way, how do I live a life of integrity? By living according to your word. You must stay in this book. And if you don't stay in this book, you will not have the strength and the stamina to live with integrity. I've said it many times, that if I don't have a daily time with God in the word, if I don't have a daily quiet time, and if I miss it for a few days, I notice it. Because I start getting cranky. If I'm not in the word. If I don't have a quiet time for a week, my wife notices it. <laughs> if I didn't have a quiet time for a month, you would notice it. Because I would not have any power, spiritual power, to clearly explain the word of God to you. You gotta stay in the word. Now, this message today, it's been tough for me to share and tough for you to hear. It's a tough message, because when I go through this checklist, and I go down this list of six things, I, I, I'm thinking in my own mind, fail, 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 fail. You know, I'm just going, oh my. And I, I'm not really feeling that good about it, but here's the good point. St. Augustine said this, the confession of bad works is the beginning of good works. And so if you are serious about becoming a woman of integrity, if you are serious about becoming a man of integrity, the first step is to own up that you haven't had integrity. And just admit it, I haven't, okay? I admit it, God, I don't always keep my promises. I admit it, God, I don't always pay my bills on time. I, I, I admit it that I often gossip and I like it. And it's a juicy morsel to chew on it. And God, I, I admit it, that I've been spending your money. I've been robbing God. I've been using the tithe to pay my own bills. I've lacked integrity there. And I admit it, I, I, I don't always do my best at work. Sometimes I just slack off. Sometimes I take a little extra time running some errands. And sometimes I don't put in the full amount and I don't do my best. And I've taken some supplies home and I I just, I, it's in the little things that Tom talked about. And there had been a lot of times, Lord, I'm not really real with people, I fake it. And I don't pretend, I, mean, I do pretend, I don't, I don't really be who I really am. And I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a phony, I wear a mask some of the times out of my own insecurities. And God, I admit it, I have segmented my life. And I've said, I've acted this way here, and I've acted this way here, and, I've acted this way, oh, this little sex life over here, this is just my little habit over here, and this over here, this is my little secret over here, and, and this over here, this is my, and I just keep them all separate. And, and it's, it goes back to that thing about the Titanic myth. Did I share that with you? Did I talk about the Titanic myth? The Titanic myth is this myth that you can segment your life and it'll keep you afloat. The Titanic was supposed to be the first unsinkable ship, because it was the first ship 
that they ever segmented the hull. Previous and prior to the Titanic, all hulls of a boat were just one open hull. And so if you were out in a boat and you hit a rock or another boat or an iceberg and you knocked a hole in the boat, then water would flood in, it would fill up the whole hull and the ship would sink. The Titanic was the first ship to actually segment and compartmentalize the hull and they said, you know, theoretically, it's kind of like we do with, with uh, uh, submarines today, you know, you, you segment the submarine so if you take on water in a certain area, you can batten down the hatch and the idea is you could take on a certain amount of water and it won't sink, sink the whole ship. And theoretically, that's true. But folks, when it comes to life, your life, a hole in the boat is a hole in the boat is a hole in the boat. And eventually, it's gonna sink you. And that little area you think you've got under control over here, it isn't under control, and it's gonna take you down. Now, if you and I go out and we go fishing, and you're sitting at one end of the boat, and I'm sitting at the other end of the boat, and I pull out a drill, a wood drill, and I start drilling a hole in my end of the boat, you're gonna get concerned. You say, Rick, what are you doing? You're gonna take us down. And, this is the typical response today, hey, it's my life. Nobody has a right to tell me what I do with my life. I can handle it, I'm a grown adult, I can sin and get away with it. I, you, it's none of your business what I do with my life. I'm sorry, but it is my business what you do with your life because we're all in the same boat. It's called Earth. And we're all in this together. And you cannot sin and it not affect other people. I'm sorry, you just don't understand how it works. The truth is, this is gonna be very profound, but it's said in a very simple way. Sin may be personal, but it is never private. My sin may be personal, I did it, but it's never private. Even if you don't ever know about the sins in my life, they affect you. Husbands, even if your wife never knows about the sins in your life, they affect her. Wives, even if your husbands don't know about the sins in your life, they affect him, and they affect your kids, and we affect each other. You cannot do anything in life without affecting each other, and so the idea of it's none of my business is just stupid. It is your business, it is my business, because we affect each other. And even if some people never even know about something in my life, it's still gonna affect them in different ways because of the blessing of God or the removal of blessing of God on my life and on your life. The Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. Now this is why, friends, we need a savior, okay? What we just talked about today, this is why you need the sa a savior. This is why we need the cross. This is why we need grace. This is why we need forgiveness. Why? Because none of us measure up. None of us are perfect. The Bible says there's not a just man on the earth who always does what is right and never does what is wrong. The Bible says we have all sinned and we have all fallen short. So each of us have our own unique falling shorts. You have your falling shorts and I have my falling shorts, but thank God he forgives all our falling shorts. All of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. This is why you need grace, you need a savior, because there's no way I can measure up to God's perfection. There's no way you can either. God doesn't expect you to be perfect. He does expect you to have integrity, which means you own up. And the starting point to be a man of God or a woman of God is to say, I admit it, I just don't have integrity in some of these areas. What really matters is the direction of your heart. You know, friends, I don't always do it right. Your pastor is a very flawed individual. I don't always get it right. I make a lot of mistakes. I sin. I, I, I'm not always unselfish, I wanna be, but I'm not. I'm not always kind to everybody. I wanna be, but I'm not. I don't always keep my promises. I want to, but I'm not, I don't. I, I don't always do my best 
in everything that I do. I want to, but I don't. And I look at all, I don't always, I don't wanna gossip, I don't wanna listen to gossip, but sometimes I do. But in the deepest part of my heart, in spite of my own sinfulness, I want to do the right thing. And I want to be a man of integrity. And fortunately, God looks down on Rick Warren, and when he looks at me, he doesn't say, what a screw up, what a failure. He ought to know better than that. Why did he still fall for that one? Instead, God looks down and says, there's a guy who has a heart for me, and I'm gonna bless him. I'll say it again, God is more interested in your heart than your sins. You're never gonna be perfect. You're never gonna be sinless, but you can sin less. You got it? Get it? Good. You're never gonna be sinless, but you can sin less. And that is a choice, and it is a choice of integrity. And it starts by saying to God, God, I don't always keep my promises, but I want to. God, I don't always pay my bills, but I want to. God, I, I don't always, I haven't refused gossip. I've listened to it, but I don't want that anymore. God, I don't wanna rob you of money that's yours. I, I, as an act of integrity, I wanna tithe. And God, I don't always do what's best at work, and I don't always give it my best shot, but I want to, and that's my direction. And, and God, I have to admit, I'm, I'm not real a lot of times. A lot of times I'm faking it, I'm living insecurely. Again, it's because of insecurity comes from a lack of integrity. And when you come to God and say, God, this is my heart, and I really want it to be in this direction, then God could say about you like he did about David. Remember, the guy who committed adultery and murder. There's a guy after my own heart. He looked past all the mistakes that had been made, and he looked at the direction of David's heart and says, the guy's got a good heart. He's going in the right direction. He wants to do the right thing. And that comes from the power and the grace of God. Let's bow our heads. I'm gonna pray a prayer and you can just follow me in it. Make it your prayer to God. Dear Jesus Christ, I thank you that you were sinless. You never sinned. You were the ultimate example of integrity. And so you could pay the price for all my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Just say that in your mind. Thank you for dying on the cross for me, for paying all my sins. There is no way, God, that I can measure up to your standard of perfection. And that's why I need your grace. And that's why I need your forgiveness. And that's why I need your salvation. And Jesus, thank you for loving me enough to pay for all my sins. The confession of bad works is the beginning of good works, so why don't you just have a little confession time with God. Why don't you say, God, I admit that I don't always keep my promises, but I want to. And God, I admit that I've, I've, I've spent more money than I make and I've got myself really deeply in debt and I haven't paid off all my debts, but I want to. And I ask you to help me. to Stop spending more than I make so I can start paying off my debts and be a person of integrity. And God, I, I admit that I have gossiped, I have shared secrets, I've listened to gossip, I've slandered other people, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't wanna be that way. And God, I, I haven't put you first in my money. I've paid everything except my tithe. I put you in last place, not first. As an act of integrity, I'm gonna start tithing. And God, I admit that I, I don't always do my best 
I don't always work hard and cheerfully. A lot of times I just slack off because I don't really like my job some days. Help me to remember that whether anybody else notices what I do, you notice. Help me to do my work with excellence, with quality, and with integrity, knowing that I'm working for you as my real boss. And God, I need you to give me the courage to be real with other people. I'm tired of wearing masks. I'm tired of playing games. I'm tired of maneuvering and manipulating behind the scenes. I want to live my life as an open book. Not perfect, not sinless, but authentic and whole. I want today Jesus Christ to commit to becoming a man or a woman of integrity. I want a pure heart that you can bless. Help me to stay in the word every day that it is your word that keeps me pure. If you've never invited Jesus Christ to forgive all your sins and to be the savior and the Lord of your life, say, Jesus Christ, I don't understand it all, but I wanna thank you for dying for my sins. And I ask you to become the, the leader, the Lord, the manager, the boss of my life. And I want your purpose and peace and plan and power. And I humbly ask this in your name. Amen.